All right, we're going to be talking about the concept of gas exchange, which is really closely related to the idea of perfusion. We'll be completing concept study guide version B, and you'll be in both your Giddens chapter 19 and Davis chapter 36 for this lesson. So here's our objectives for this lesson. We're gonna complete that concept study guide and we're gonna talk about this concept of gas exchange. What does it mean? What's the difference between ventilation and respiration? What are some key terms that we need to know? And having a basic understanding of the A and P, the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system. We're gonna look for those signs and symptoms of um, impaired gas exchange, identify factors that influence pulmonary function recognize when a patient has a compromised gas exchange, and talk about what do we do about this? What are the nursing and collaborative interventions and pharmacology involved with gas exchange? So let's go ahead and start with just a basic definition of gas exchange. So the, the concept of gas exchange is really just that process where oxygen is transported to the cells and carbon dioxide is transported away from the cells. Our bodies are at the cellular level, we need oxygen to, for life. So oxygen goes in, carbon dioxide goes out. And it's just this exchange of gases that is called the concept of gas exchange. And similar to our perfusion scope, the scope of this concept goes from optimal gas exchange where everything's working well, oxygen's going in, carbon dioxide's going out, to some kind of impairment to no gas exchange. Now, in order to talk about the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system, I'm actually going to link you to two different TED Ed videos in the chat box below or the description box below. Uh, one is on the how the lungs work and the other is on how oxygen is transported through our body. So go ahead and pause here and take a look at those, then come back and we'll continue on. Now, here are some key terms you need to know about gas exchange. Hypoxia. Hypoxia means low oxygen in the tissues or organs. SpO2 is how we measure oxygen saturation. It's one of our main vital signs that we take on our patients. And it's measured with that pulse oximetry reading. And the normal range for SpO2 for O2 sat is 95 to 100%. And that means that 95 to 100% of the uh, red blood cells capable of carrying oxygen are carrying oxygen. Anoxia is the lack of oxygen and hypoxemia means low oxygen concentrations in the arteries. Remember arteries are carrying oxygenated blood from the heart and it's low oxygen concentration in the arteries itself. Now this is measured with the partial pressure of oxygen in the arteries, it's called the PaO2, and it measures, it's measured with venous blood gas um, or arterial blood gas, and the normal range for a PaO2, the amount of oxygen in the arteries, should be between 80 to 110 millimeters of mercury. Let's talk about the difference between ventilation and respiration. Ventilation is like when you open a window and you have airflow in and out of the window. That's what ventilation is. It's just the movement of air in and out of the lungs. And respiration is the actual exchange of, of gases, the exchange of oxygen for carbon dioxide. So again, ventilation is just the movement of air in and out of the lungs, just like opening a window moves air in and out of your house. And so it's an involuntary thing. It's mediated by chemoreceptors and lung receptors that, that sense that you, know, you need to take a breath. And so it just happens. You don't have to think about breathing. And there's two parts of ventilation. Um, there's inspiration when we take a breath in and the chest rises and oxygen air flows in. And then there's expiration where the chest falls and air, specifically carbon dioxide, is going to flow out. So air goes in with inspiration, air goes out with expiration. We breathe in air, which has oxygen in it. We breathe out air that has carbon dioxide in it. That is the process of ventilation. Now there's different things that affect ventilation. The rate, how many times per minute are we breathing? The depth, how deep of breaths are we taking? The lung compliance and elasticity, how 
easy is it for the lungs to open and move freely? Are they tight or are they able to freely move? And is there any resistance in the airway, any constriction that's making the airway from the outside down to the lungs smaller that causes less air to be able to move in and out of the lungs? Now, respiration, on the other hand, is that exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen. It's the movement of gas, oxygen, and carbon dioxide from one area to another. And typically, it's going to be moving from a high pressure area to a low pressure area. Now, gas exchange is going to occur um, both between the lungs and the bloodstream, and then between the bloodstream and the tissue. So between the lungs and the bloodstream is when carbon dioxide comes out of the of the bloodstream back into the lungs so we can breathe it out. And oxygen moves from the lungs into the bloodstream so it can be transported to the body. So this, this exchange happens externally between the lungs and the bloodstream. And then it happens internally between the bloodstream and the tissue where that oxygenated blood goes to the tissue, the oxygen leaves the bloodstream, goes into the tissue, and the carbon dioxide in the tissue goes back into the bloodstream, back up into the body where it can be blown off by the lungs. So it happens between the lungs and the bloodstream, it happens between the bloodstream and the tissue, and that's how gas exchange happens in our body. Now we've talked about ventilation, we've talked about respiration, we need to talk about transport. So you have to have something to transport the oxygen in the bloodstream. And specifically, it's the job of the hemoglobin to transport and carry oxygen in the bloodstream. So we need to have adequate hemoglobin levels, blood levels, in order to transport this oxygen. And so it varies slightly for men and women, but the average is here on the screen, anywhere from 12 to 17.5 grams per deciliter is our normal hemoglobin level. Now a hemoglobin is a typical lab that's part of the complete blood count. So anytime you're ordering a CBC on a patient or, or anytime an, a CBC has been ordered on a patient, um, you're gonna see a hemoglobin level as part of that uh, lab study. Now, we know with any nursing concept, not everything is always optimal. There's going to be times when things um, are variations and there's going to be impairment in gas exchange. And this is when this happens, it means that there's a problem with the diffusion of gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide. And this can happen for three different reasons. You can have ineffective ventilation. The movement of air in and out of the lungs is just not happening very well or happening at all. You can have a reduced capacity for transport. You have to be able to have those red blood cells and the hemoglobin to transport oxygen through the body. And you can have inadequate perfusion because you have to have blood flow in order for the oxygen to reach the tissues to have that gas exchange. So if you have problems with ventilation, problems with transport with hemoglobin and red blood cells, or problems with perfusion blood flow to the tissues, we're gonna see problems and impairment with gas exchange. Now, anytime we have an impairment in our body, we're gonna see consequences. And so a mild impairment in gas exchange might result in fatigue because you're just not getting oxygen as well as you need to. Or the body might start trying to compensate by an increase in heart rate or respiratory rate. With more severe impairment, impairment more uh, severe gas exchange problems, you can result in a respiratory acidosis um, and keeping too much uh, carbon dioxide in the body. And if the uh, impairment is prolonged or very severe, it's going to result in tissue ischemia, necrosis, and eventually death if it's not dealt with. 